so good afternoon. Welcome to the second lecture of uh, this of this mini school on elementary introduction to the category theory. And Amartya and Zurab will continue this wonderful and exciting lecture. And uh, I just want to remind everyone so that you can write your questions into the Q and A. Uh, that's the first way. And the second way, because uh, there are not so many of us, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we can give you a right to talk. Okay, Amartya and Zurab, you're welcome to start. Thank you very much, Ilya. Um, thank you everyone for, uh, for joining. Uh, what we have here, uh, a, a bit of news is uh, the blog we, we created. Uh, the address to that is written on the screen. Uh, it will contain write-up of lectures, uh, and you can also ask questions through comment section of the blog, and we will try to answer it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so that's that's in between the in the, between the lectures. Otherwise, uh, for today's lecture, please feel free to interrupt and ask. Um, so, Amorto, um, where do we go from? From where we left off, what do you think? Uh, last week we actually gave an example which is not a category uh, because it was not satisfying those axioms of a category and we actually started with this uh, finite sets or numbers, integers, positive integers and then we considered this divisibility and this less than equal to uh, relation. So maybe we can tell more about those and the connection uh, between these type of things and numbers. So maybe numbers is good to start back again. Um, you know, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, something about examples uh, mm -hmm. of a category and indeed uh, I'm starting to remember now that's where we, we stopped. We said we will talk more about examples, but I'm wondering yeah. if we should maybe Kind of begin with revealing the big secret about about categories. Yeah, um, that, that that will be a good idea. Yeah. So, in terms of how does one search for examples, where does one find examples, and how one maybe can uh, can create one's own new exciting examples of categories? Well, mm -hmm. uh, maybe because we define the category um, in terms of a directed graph, maybe we should first remind everyone what is the big secret about directed graphs. Hmm. So when we have a directed graph, um, which is something of this kind, right? At this point, mm -hmm. it's just some kind of um, a picture, right? But in practice, yes. when we create a directed graph out of a, of a given scenario in life or in science or any other area of our interest, um, the way these directed graphs usually arise is that the vertices, right, mm -hmm. they represent uh, some objects, some entities. Yes. And the arrows represent certain type of relationship between them. Yeah, like some kind example, of process. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the other example we had, for instance, with the div divisibility relation. So um, in this situation, we could think of objects representing the numbers and the arrow represent, representing the fact that one number divides another, A mm -hmm. divides B, uh, for example, three divides six. In other words, six is divisible by three. So when we have a directed graph where there is only one, at most one arrow between two vertices, it usually comes out from uh, some kind of relationship we have between objects. But in our case, we have uh, directed arrows, we, we are allowing to have the, the several directed arrows between given several vertices, different, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Now, and, and that's a, a, actually a very natural generalization because we could have relationships of different kinds. Yes, absolutely. Two objects, right? mm, mm. Okay, so, so that's the big, uh, the big secret about directed graphs, that the way they arise from, uh, from life, from science, from, from uh, any any place we're at in, in our mind um, is that the, the vertices are uh, the objects we want to, to study, the, the objects we want to understand, and the arrows are uh, some kind of relationships between them. Yeah. But now in uh, this maybe, context, yeah, yeah you, wanna, you wanna ask something uh, about I'm that? just saying that maybe we should remind our uh, audience that 
in general in graph theory uh, we do not make any gap between when we draw arrow and for our case whether we draw like this and we draw like this is actually essentially the same thing right yeah that's an interesting thing to to draw these arrows in two different ways i think mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken i recently saw a uh, handwritten work of Charles Eresman, a French category mm. theorist. Yes, yes. I think he draws it the same way as you did in the top line there. Oh, ah, okay, okay. Um, yeah. Now, uh, what about composition? So uh, a category was defined as a, as a directed graph with composition, right? So with what is the big yes. secret about composition? How does composition arise uh, in, in, in real life scenarios or, or in science? Yeah? So. The big secret there is, is actually quite simple. Um, when you have a relationship from A to B, let's call this relationship F. And when you have a relationship from B to C, let's call this relationship G, right? Um, knowing that A is related to B somehow by, by mm -hmm. the F way, yeah? the F holds the information of how a is related to B, and there could be many different with ways. B. So we pick one and, F. and knowing how B is related to C, what we want to do is to make a conclusion from these two relationships. What conclusion can be drawn? How is A related to C? To and that's C. how, yeah, and, and, that, and that's how composition arises in examples. Hmm. The composition of, of arrows is the total effect of this relationship. So if, if I know A is related to B somehow, and I know B is related to C somehow, what is the conclusion? What relationship does this give me from A to C? Uh, a very simple example of this is, of course, um, for, for instance, um, uh, Peter, uh, who is the, uh, the son of uh, uh, Mark, and uh, Mark uh, has a sister uh, called Tamar. And uh, the combined relationship, of course, I mean, so, so the first arrow was the relationship of being son of, and, and the, the other was the relationship of being brother of. Yes. And of course, we, we can think of the combined relationship here as being, uh, so Tamar being the aunt of, of Peter, right? Yes, yes. Um, What's the other way around? Um, if, if somebody is your aunt, your your nephew to that person, I don't forgot about the word. Is it nephew? Uh, uh, maybe that. we can uh, we can take help from our audience. This yeah. is not a mathematical question. Could somebody help us to to confirm yes. please that somebody replied? <laughs> yes. Ilya, so Ilya said yes, I think. Ah, yes. Okay, Daniel Kin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. Uh, relationships compose, and, and this composition is kind of our process of making logical conclusion of, I mean, it's it, it, it's some, so basically composition is bringing in logic into this data of relationships, and, and that's why categories are such natural things that occur everywhere. Yeah, and uh, Zura, maybe we also notice that the first relationship was son, second was brother, but the composite could be absolutely different. That's right, yes. And in, in, so in a directed is, yeah. graph, we, we don't have that opportunity because hmm. especially when the directed graph has only allows one edge, um, yes. then uh, for example, if, if we take a directed graph where the, all the arrows just rep re represent child relationship, right? So hmm. if, one thing is a child of another, and the other is a child of the third one, hmm. uh, then, it, then of course it doesn't mean that, that this will be a child of the third, right? But, yes, yes. But the first one will be a grandchild of the, of the third, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, uh, so directed graph doesn't know uh, what conclusions we can draw from existence of relationships between the objects. Hmm. But a category knows. So a category is category. Uh, equipping directed graph with that very much needed information because without make, being able to make conclusions, we will be able to do very little thing, right? Hmm. Okay, so with this little bit of philosophical example, 
since you said we should we should go back to numbers somehow, um, let's go back to numbers. But let's consider uh, uh, not the divisibility relationship, but something else. Uh, something Maybe product. Hmm? How product. do we product to numbers? How do we multiply to numbers? If we multiply two numbers, can we represent it nicely, or what does it mean by that? Okay, that's a good question. So, are you are you asking how how category theory is going to help us understand multiplication of numbers? Yes, for example, we all know from our childhood uh, this looks like, but. Uh, can we can we give some light on this simple multiplication of two integers from the categorical point of view? You know what? I think we can. Um, ah, that will be fantastic. And I think uh, the way to do that is exactly will exactly match with what I was going to propose. We we're going to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so let's do that. <clears throat> so uh, let's take these two numbers, six and three. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's think of them as something more than just a number. Let's think of them as uh, a set of six objects or a set of three objects. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so just it's this. a bit like yeah. going to, oh, um, to childhood where we yeah. define, we, when we illustrate numbers, um, um, the first time we learn about numbers, right? We illustrate them as uh, as a collection yes. of uh, entities of that amount. Entities, yes, yes. Um, now, if I look at this picture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, before I look at this picture, I might be thinking of divisibility or I might be thinking of less or equal as the relationship. But when I look at this picture, something else might come to my mind. For, for example, if I concretize even more and think of these six um dots as six apples right yeah and i think of the three dots as three boxes um and with this uh, visualization and with with the question of what kind of relationships could there exist between six apples and three boxes i immediately start to think about um putting these apples into those boxes right and how many ways we can do that um, well, it will be interesting to see how many ways we can do that. But before we count mm. how many ways we can do that, let's maybe yes. make it more precise. What, what does it mean to put apples in, in the boxes? In the boxes, yes. Mm. So it's well, a process, right? Because we are taking something from the left-hand side and moving it on the right-hand side. Right. It, it, it is a process, indeed. And, and this process um, assigns to each apple the box in mm -hmm. which it will be placed, right? Yes. Let's yes. say this one goes there, and maybe you can help me to to put these apples in the boxes. Okay. Please. And there is no restriction who will Actually, go where, right? Uh, Amorto, can I suggest that yeah. we use the same color? So I'm going to erase my okay. arrows and, and and draw new ones with the same color as yours. Because Maybe the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to think of one way of arranging um, apples into boxes, right? Hmm. As one specific relationship between number six and number three. And of course, what we get here is nothing other than a mathematical function. So a function assigns to every um, object in the in the domain set. So the the in our case, it's the left-hand side one. Uh, it assigns some object in the codomain set. Yes. Uh, so that's the right-hand side one. And these assignments can be drawn like this. And the requirement for a mathematical function is that everything must must be assigned somewhere, mm -hmm. and and each thing must only be assigned to a unique spot. Unique so spot on the right-hand side. Yeah. yeah. It, it really kind of corresponds to putting apples in the boxes because you, you can't like put the same apple to, in two different, in two boxes, different boxes at the same yes, time. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And also we, we, do not, we, we absolutely want to put all the apples in the boxes. We don't want to leave any apples behind. So these two rules is what defines a, a function. And then so I'm how going do you to, say, yeah? yeah? 
are you saying that there is some relationship uh, between the fact that how many ways we can put these apples in boxes and this concept of functions? Well, you're, you're again trying to take me to the to, to counting how many ways we can do this. But uh -huh. before before I want I count that, can I just draw this arrow from six to three? Yeah, just to finish it, yeah. And, and give it a name. Oh, you also changed the color of your arrows because I did the same thing and now they're again two different colors. Oh, okay. So let me change with the red one then now. So from now on, it will be red then. So I'm going to call this arrow F. Um, and so what F represents is um, placement of F apples in the boxes the way that, that it's shown on the picture. Hmm. Um, did you change those arrows or not yet? Or should I do uh, that? No, let me change it because then it will be easier. Um, and of course, I could I could arrange the same um, uh, apples uh, in a in a different way into the um, into the boxes, and that hmm. different arrangement would have been another arrow from six to three. Another arrow, yes. So what we're actually doing here, we're defining a category, right? Uh, so let's actually make this a bit more explicit. So we're defining a category here. Um, we, we still have to see how composition will work. Um, mm. So the uh, objects in this category are natural numbers. So that includes zero, one, two, and so on. Uh, the arrows in the category are defined like this. So uh, if I have two numbers, n and m, an arrow f from n to m is a function um, from a set of n elements to a set of m elements. Yeah, but I don't want to use this technical mathematical language here. But then we can uh, write it like n equal to like this. But yeah, then maybe but this, is already, to... this is already looks very mathematical. Um, <laughs> okay. okay, that's okay. That's fine. If if the if the audience forgives us to do that, then we can do that. But so then we need function. to put some. Uh, some yeah. symbol here because not to create a confusion between this in and that. Yeah, you end. see, and, and then the technical notation starts to enter this story. I, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. Um, can we maybe can, can we do the following way? Can, can we say mm -hmm. it, it is a um, uh, is a function uh, mapping. the numbers from one to n to the numbers from one to m. So if I go to the previous picture, mm. if I move up to the previous slide we had there, we could have we could have labeled these apples with numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could have called it, uh, yeah, like that one, two, three, four, five, six. And we could have also labeled boxes with numbers and yeah. then, uh, so this function would say, so then let's write out the values of f. So f of one, right, would be the yeah. box in which box in which one was placed. Uh, so that maybe it will not fit on this frame. Maybe we one. should move a little bit down. No, I think it will. I think it will. And f okay. of two will be one. F of three. So what is, what is the box in which apple number three? three? Yeah, it's three. three. Okay, so it's a, it's a coincidence that uh, f of something is always that thing back, right? f of four is two. Oh, oh, of course, it will not fit if you write big, Amorto. Yeah. Yeah, but if I write, I write small, you see, and then it will fit. <laughs> I'm sorry for being rude. Um, mm -hmm. f of three equals uh, three. Uh, f of four equals two. F of uh, five, okay, okay, I lose. It doesn't fit either. F of six yes. equals uh, one. One, yes. So that's how so we can this, turn this, yeah? Yeah, so this defines one function. This defines uh, one function, yes. Mm -hmm. 
and so another uh, function would be another arrow from the same uh, number six right. to number three and in general from number n to m uh, that's what the arrows are okay now right. let's define composition mm -hmm. so if i'm really placing apples into boxes i can i can further put boxes into trucks Yes. For the delivery, right? And so basically, that's the idea of composition. So if I put this apple in that box and I put that apple in that box and keep the third box empty, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let's label these things one, two, one, two, three, one, two. So we have one function here. Um, that uh, so if this if this is f and that's g so we, we now have f representing something different than what we had before maybe that's not a good idea let's call this h um h and g so yeah. h of one is one and h of two is is two right and, yeah. and according to what you're drawing there so the the, the the first and the second box is going to the first car so g of one is equal one to one, one, and g of two is equal to one, and, and g, g of three, three is, is equal two. to two. two. Um, so as a result of first putting apples into boxes and then putting boxes into the cars, mm. uh, as a result of that, we will get that the apples have been distributed in the cars, right? And yeah. that result is, the, is going to be the composition. Right. So this is a very, very practical examples where we define first functions and then we define the compositions of the functions. Yeah. So on this mm -hmm. picture, um, there are two ways I can I can do this. I can I, I can follow the arrows, right? One goes to one and then one goes to one again. So the composite will mm -hmm. have one mapping to one there. And I'm using the purple color this time. And um, two goes into the box two, and, and the box two goes into the car one. So two will also map to one, right? Two as yes. There will, be, there will be no apple being placed in the second car, because all the apples went into the boxes that went into the first car. And so mm -hmm. mathematically, uh, we could, of course, write this in the following way. So we say G composed with H, evaluated at X is, um, g evaluated at h evaluated at, at x yes so x is the apple h of x is the box in which apple was placed and g of that box is the car in which the box was placed and uh, maybe we should uh, look this thir third case where we have a box but there is no apple which can put it in that box so that third box doesn't play any role in this composition Uh, maybe you can draw that on, on the other side of the board while I'm uh, writing this one up. I'm not sure I understood what you said. Uh, I'm saying that uh, we define this G compose F, uh, sorry, G compose H, right? Right. And uh, there is no such H for uh, the box three. I mean, there is no apple which goes to box three. Yeah, no apple goes to box, uh, empty box. No apples, yeah. Yeah. So what about it? Uh, then uh, whenever we do this composition, taking some some apple in a box and box to the car, that kind of composition is not happening with the box three, number three, because yeah, it I mean, has a box. Uh, yeah. You're right. I mean, the, the the fact that we had a third box, mm -hmm. that information was lost. We only know that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, with the composite, we only know which apples have been placed in which cars. And and uh, what what happened in the middle? Of, uh, so so composition does lose some information. I mean, just like in the other example, mm -hmm. if I go back to the other example, um, uh, when uh, Peter is nephew of Tamar, um, uh, we don't know uh, with this in, just with this information. We don't know who is Mark. Mm -hmm. we, we lost some information Absolutely. about Mark. Huh? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, okay, so we, we're kind of setting up a category here, right? We, we're, we said what the objects are. We said mm -hmm. what the arrows are. We described what composition is. And now we need to get convinced that this will be a category indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, but isn't it we also mentioned that every uh, object should have some extra specific morphism? Map yes. arrow between itself? Well, I mean, that's, 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 that's our second axiom, that such arrow uh -huh. will exist, right? Yes, yes. Um, now, one could go on and, and one could check that. Um, but I'm, I'm also kind of thinking uh, about time. So maybe mm. we... We don't check that it's a category. We just maybe make a note that um, uh, it's kind of intuitively not difficult to see that it should be a category. But if it is difficult, one would have to spend a little bit of time on it. Time to check um, that here. Yeah. So I'm going to add um, um, the explanation why this thing is a category in the mm -hmm. blog. Um, and so uh, the, anyone listening to this could 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 try to see himself or herself why and then and then mm -hmm. test the answer against what what will be in the block so instead of yeah. checking that it's a category let's, let's believe it will be a category so yeah that, that means that the associativity law will hold so, so remember that being a category means that um the associativity law holds so when yeah. i have um three arrows um f g h i compose them this way and then with f the, that way is the same as this and axiom two requires for every object uh, there to exist this identity arrow, right? Yeah. So that composing uh, something with one side or the, on the other side will always uh, give uh, that same arrow. Yeah. So this is the summary, summary of the axiom. Mm -hmm. And one can check that these axioms hold. Um, and it's actually not too difficult to check. I mean, at least let, let's write down the algebraic um, kind of the, the symbolic computation verifying that. So if I really go back to uh, the, the, the functional way of thinking about these arrows instead of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so if I take that composite function and apply to X. Right? So maybe in the meantime, I write the other one off. Let's use the same color. Uh, that's going to be the same as F applied to decomposed with h applied to x by the way composition was defined and by the way g composed h is defined that's the same as f applied to so we, we keep that part and then we say say as g applied to h applied to x right um and so um that's one side uh, of of this equality and the other side um, will have a similar calculation leading to, to the same answer. So yeah. um, Amorto didn't leave too much space for me. So I'm oh, sorry. A little we cannot also here. move it again. No, no, we can't move anything on this board, unfortunately. So a little insertion there. I could have computed the other way around, where I, I first tried to apply that composite to a variable x. And that's the same as this thing applied to h applied to x and that's the same by definition of f composed with g f applied to g applied to h of x and um, we, we do get the same answer in, in both yes. cases as we see here this exactly matches with that and also for for those uh, identity laws we um, we get that um, that exactly matches with with, with that and so that shows that that Equality and, uh, and so on. We, we hope that we didn't make any typographical mistakes because our um, audience, we are very careful also. Yeah. So this is just kind of the computational um, part of the story, but we could also mm. draw pictures and get convinced that these axioms hold just by looking at those pictures. Right. So instead of going in detail into that, uh, let us um, uh, now do something interesting in this category and, and in fact let us explain um, hmm. how how this category can help us understand multiplication so you had uh -huh. six right. times uh, three equals 18. yes
So I'm going to draw uh, six dots uh, in a row like that, well, in a line like that. And then I'm going to draw three dots in a line like this. And then I'm going to draw six times three as a grid of dimension six by three, because then I get exactly six times three, in other words, 18 dots, right? 18, 18 dots, yes. So I'm kind of representing number six as um, a set of apples or boxes, some, some set of mm -hmm. objects. Um, I mean, in, in, our, in our case, we, we very explicitly said that uh, we kind of, when we start describing what arrows are, mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we start thinking of the number as the set of all the numbers from one to, to that number. Yes. So we could really think of this as uh, numbers one, two, three, and so on. Um, and the same on the other side. Uh, and then we could in some way number the things in the grid as well. But let's not go into those technical details. Let, let's just look at these two pictures. Uh, there are two obvious functions here. So if I think of this as a set of objects and that as another set of objects and this one as well, there are two obvious functions going that way and this way. Um, so do you, do you see what I mean, Amorto? Uh, you mean we have here 18 dots. Here we have six dots, and here we have three dots. Yeah. Um, okay. How are they related? Eighteen and six. So how would you how would you place these eighteen uh, items into into these six items? Is there some something that comes to mind when you look at the picture? Maybe. Well, one way we yeah. can put three three uh, associate three dots with one dot. Yeah, so you, so you take so take all of these into here, right? Yes, yes, something like that. Yeah, so it's a kind of projection, isn't it? If, if we think of this, yes, thing, yes. If the x is yeah. going that in that in that direction, then we're projecting. Mm -hmm. We can project yeah. onto this six by by layering these things like that. So these three map along those dotted lines to that dot, and the next right. three map to that dot, and so on. Yeah, so we can actually make a s s simple like this too understand yeah and but similarly the is not yeah. to draw those circles because then it's going to interfere with the i, I want to draw the same picture uh, mm -hmm. in a, another map going from 18 to 3 another function going from 18 to 3 ah, okay. which is going to and be then, the other way around yeah so we can put all these six dots in one dot that's Project right them in yes. one dot. So let's let me color code them. So this is going to be uh, a purple uh, function, purple arrow, and the other yeah. one. Uh, let me, maybe let blue. me use uh, what color shall we use for the other one? Okay, I'm using, using blue. Blue, uh, great. Um, so all of these six, all of them would be placed in here and, and, and right. so on, right? Right. right? So there are these two functions we have from 18 to 6 and 18 to 3. Right. Now, uh, if we think of this grid as a kind of physical space to move around it, right? Mm -hmm. And if I think of, uh, let's say, number um, uh, 4, um, as time interval consisting of four instances of time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think of if, if I build some function from, from this set, uh, from, from number four, in other words, to, to number 18, and I kind of intuitively think of that, and this is going to be green um, color, intuitively think of that as some particle moving around the, the grid. So maybe the first, at first time instance, the particle mm -hmm. was there, and at the second time instance, the particle is here. Mm -hmm. And at the third time instance, the particle is there. And then suddenly, at the fourth time instance, the particle jumped right here, right? So it's right. kind of discrete type of space where we don't really know what happens in between the locations. We're just observing those locations. And we are observing that the particle moves around in some jumps. Of course, we, are, we I mean, any physicist and any mathematician understands that 
uh, such uh, a trajectory or, or the, the movement of the particle uh, is uniquely determined by what happens on the uh, by projecting this movement onto the two axes, right? Hmm. Um, so we could read off the, uh, the the purple coordinate of of the first location um, um, each time. So. Um, So it, it, it initial time, the particle was here and uh, its purple coordinate is, um, is the one I drew, drew there, right? So in the second instance of time, the purple coordinate will be this one. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. And then the third one will still be the, the, the same as the first. And the last one will be uh, that one. Oops, sorry. Something else, yes. Yeah. And I could I could do the same thing on the other side. On the other side, yeah. Um, so let's do I'm, another color. I'm to run run out of colors soon. Mm -hmm. oh, there is a light aqua blue. Yeah, yeah, great. I pick that one. So on the other side, I'm going to get. Okay, so um, we did two. That that, the third one goes here, and the fourth one also goes here. Now the, right. the picture got quite messy. Mm. Um, so, so this uh, these arrows, the the one that uh, goes from four to six, right, mm. and the one that goes from um, four to three. Four to three. Uh, these arrows uniquely determine the the middle one, the, the one that goes from uh, four to eighteen. What do you mean by that? Um, so. Uh, if I label all of these arrows, right? So let's call yes. the one that was going from 18 to 6. Let's call this uh, with Greek letter pi, pi 1. Mm -hmm. The one going from 18 to 3, let's call this pi, pi two. 2, right? Mm -hmm. And the one going from 4 to 6, let's call that one f. And the one mm -hmm. going from 4 to 3, let's call that one um, uh, g, g, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and the one in the middle, let's call that one H. Mm -hmm. Now, if I if I uh, carry out the H uh, function and then compose that with pi one, it's like putting the apples into boxes and boxes into cars. Boxes to so the I'm, car. I'm, I'm yes. first uh, taking it a time instance. I'm seeing yes. uh, where is this where is this time instance. Uh, map to here. In other words, what is the location on the grid of my object? Mm -hmm. And then I'm looking at, after that, I'm looking at the uh, the coordinate of that object on, onto the, uh, the left axis, right? Mm -hmm. So this is exactly composition, huh? Yes. So what I'm trying so to say saying, here, yeah? So you are saying that uh, going through this green color and then project it through red color is the same as going through this purple color F. Yes. So this composite will equal F, yes. and the other composite will naturally equal G. G. Now, what is interesting here is that information about H is uniquely determined by information about F and G. If I know F and G, I will be able yes. to recover H, and, and I can really get convinced of this in the following way. So let's say I take the first uh, time instance, and I want to see where does H make, uh, where does the map the function h map that thing too, right? So, so where is the particle right. at that instance of time? I'm going to look at its f coordinate. So right. I'm going to, to see where f maps it to. So f maps it here, right? And yeah. if I also know what, what happens to it by g, then of course this spot here is uniquely determined by its coordinates. Determined by because, this, yes, yeah. yes. Because the point on the plane is uniquely determined by the x and y coordinate. So um, what I'm trying to say is that if if I'm given f right and I'm given g, hmm. there will be exactly one h that fulfills this uh, uh, this composition property. Hmm. Yeah, and on the other hand, every h will give rise to f and g. 
So you are saying that this has to play to, I mean, some connection with this original question of six times three is 18. Well, it actually does because mm -hmm. uh, 18, right? 18 yes. together with pi one and pi two is going to be the only number that has this property that the H and the F G pair uh, uniquely determine each other. Uh, so we could okay. use this as a definition of, I mean, this is complicated, so it's, it's not clear why this would be so, but hmm. I'm proposing that this, this might be so. And, and we can actually uh, check that easily. But to check that, we will hmm. need to know how to count number of arrows from one number to the other number. So it's the question hmm. that you asked earlier. Yes, yes. Uh, so let's uh, quickly solve that question. So if I have... Hmm. Um, two numbers, uh, A and B, right? Mm -hmm. How many ways will there be to establish a function from an arrow from A to B in, in this category we're working with? Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, for example's sake, let's say A has four and B has three, and let's start right. counting. So to establish a function uh, from A to B, I have to decide where to map to this uh, object, right? And there are three choices. Right. Three choices, there are, yes. There are three choices for the first one. So let's say yeah. I choose one. Now for the second one, there are still three choices and, and the yes. first choice does not interfere with the second choice. So they're independent choices. And of yeah. course, it's a simple uh, feature from probability theory, combination yeah. combinatorics, right? They, they multiply, yeah? Right, right. And for the third one, so altogether, the number of ways of mapping the first two elements will now be three times three. And for the third yes. one, there are still three choices. So that's another time three. three. Mm. And then for the fourth one, that's also three choices. It's, I'm just drawing one of them. So altogether, mm. it's three times three times three times three. And of course, that arises as, um, so if we had four and three, then the answer is three to the power of four. So in general, the number of arrows from A to B. Will be B is, to the power A. Is B to the power A, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, so okay. what you were saying is very interesting because uh, maybe this has something to do with this special case that we know two to the power zero is one. Does it give some uh, cl uh, clarification of this fact? Uh, I think so because, but um, yeah, I, I think so. But uh, can we come back to that question after? Yeah, after uh, we can uh, answer your, your previous sure. question. Why, okay, why sure. 18 is, is, is equal to six times three. 16 times three, okay, let's do that so, first here. So, so now if I start counting how many arrows there are from four to six, that will be mm -hmm. by this rule, that will be six to the power of four, do you agree? Yes. And the number of arrows from four to three is three to the power of four. Do you agree with that? Four, yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Now, do you remember what we said? We said that uh, every arrow from four to 18, right? Yes. The information of, about arrow from four to 18 is uniquely is, determined by the information of, uh, um, about an arrow from four to six. Yes. And, 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 uh, and four, to three. four to three. Right. So right. the number of possible arrows from four to 18, right, mm. will be exactly uh, um, uh, the number of arrows here multiplied by the number of arrows there. Uh -huh. So we multiply these two big numbers. So this is exactly going to be the number of arrows, uh, whatever object object is here. We don't know yet it's 18. So let's pretend we don't mm -hmm. know it's 18. Yes, um, yes. That to the power of four. Right. Because every arrow from four to six, uh, four to 18 gives rise to two arrows, one, for, one from four to six and the other from four to three. 
and in, in a unique way. So, so if we start counting how many ways there are to have an error from four to 18, that information breaks up into two independent informations, error from four yes. to six, error from four to three. So because they're independent and they uniquely describe the other one, we, we multiply just like in the other case. Yeah, so it okay. means that if, if we can calculate the left-hand side, then we can put the value in the question mark. That's right. I mean, the, the, this is a familiar law, right? 18 is mm. the only number yes. that's going to fulfill this equality. That, that there's no other right. number. Huh? Mm. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is the following. Now, in, in a general category, I could now define uh, a way of multiplying objects. So imagine I have two objects, A and B, mm -hmm. and I define their product as some sort of object together with some sort of arrows from the object to the other two that are kind of fixated at the start of the discussion. And then I say that this, uh, this setup has, has the feature that no matter what other object C I produce, and no matter what two arrows I produce here and there, Hmm. there will exist exactly one uh, arrow yeah, H hmm. from C to A cross B, such that pi one composed with H equals pi two composed with G. So once again, uh, I'm kind of introducing uh, a new concept, a, a kind of construction that can work in any category. Uh, Zura, why this should be equal? They shouldn't. Uh, I actually made a mistake. They shouldn't be equal. But what I meant mm -hmm. to say here is that it should be F. One, yeah, this should be F. And at the same mm -hmm. time, thanks for that. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, pi two composed with H equals G. G. So if I'm given two objects in the category A and B, I could mm -hmm. consider a third object called A cross B, mm -hmm. which comes together with some arrows into A and into B. So these arrows are specified along with this object. Mm -hmm. And it has the following feature. This whole diagram has the following feature that no matter what other object I produce and no matter what other arrows F and G I produce, there will always exist exactly one arrow here one arrow. Yes. such that these equalities hold. Right. And if now I take this general notion of product of two objects, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I apply it to the category we were considering. It was the category mm -hmm. where uh, objects were numbers and arrows were functions. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we get. So if I apply it to that category, I'm going to get, uh, uh, in a specific case, when A is 6 and B is 3, right? Right. And here we, we, we need some kind of number, and, and mm -hmm. we want to consider two specific arrows there, which has the property that any other number C I pick and mm. any other, any two functions F and G I pick, right? For example, I could have picked C to be just as I did before. I could have picked C four. to be four, right? Four. Yes, yes, yes. And I could have considered any two functions. There will always exist a unique function this way. Mm. Um, uh, so this is my F, this is my G, this is my H, this is pi one, this is pi, pi two, two, such mm -hmm. that uh, H, a pi one composed with h equals f and pi two composed with h equals g. And we already know from the previous diagram, the, the one with the grid and so on, we already mm. know that 18 fulfills that role. Right. So we could put 18 here. But we also know from this discussion about six to the power four times three to the power four equal 18 to the power four, and no other yes. number fulfilling this. Uh, uh, this equality, that 18 is the only number for which this is true. So we get so basically, this. yeah, yeah. So basically, instead of four, if we take any number and take this power, of course, it is true. And that is why 18 is the right person to satisfy that yeah. condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, because the number of arrows here will always equal to the number of arrows here times the number of arrows yeah, the there side, right. because of the property that for every f and g there is exactly one h. So one h, the, right. The composition of every h into a pair of f and g and, and it's unique and, and f and g are independent of each other. So 
numbers multiply. Um, mm -hmm. So what I get is that there is a general notion of a product in a category. So this is a, a general notion of a product inside mm -hmm. that, that can work inside any category. Any category. And when, yeah. And when specializing this notion of product, this general notion of product, to the specific category where objects are numbers and mm -hmm. errors are functions, the way we described before, mm -hmm. we get uh, multiplication of numbers. Right. So basically, it gives this formula of a to the power n times b to the power n is a b to the power n. Yeah, exactly. In the, in the general case, this um, in, in terms of counting the arrows, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we get the, the formula. I mean, this property can be seen as the formula uh, uh, 6 to the power 4 times 3 to the power 4 equals 18 to the power 4. Um, but um, let, let's forget about that formula for now. So I, I want yeah. to emphasize what, what, what happened here. So your original question was to explain what is multiplication of numbers using right. the categorical uh, thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I and I did that because I gave, I'm giving you a definition of product of two objects that works in any category, irrespective of whether your category has anything to do with numbers or not. Numbers, yes, right. And then by applying this construction to a very specific category where objects are numbers, we mm -hmm. get exact multiplication. And guess what, Amorto? We could take this same diagram, the one yes. we used for defining general notion of product, and reverse all the arrows there and state the same condition. So now we'll have some object. I'm going to call this um, question mark here, something obtained from two objects A and B. But now arrows go the other way around. I'm going to call this Yota 1 and Yota 2. And mm -hmm. this other diagram. Uh, has the property, just like the other one, that if I have any other object C and any two arrows F and G, right, then there is, exists unique arrow H going this way, such that H composed with Yota 1 equals F and H composed with Yota 2 equals G. G. So what I did now is, is what is called in the category theory dualizing your, uh, your statement. You, you reverse the direction of all the arrows. And then you also are forced, as a result, to reverse direction in which things are composed with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then you, so, everything else stays the same. So we keep the object same, but we reverse the arrows. We reverse the arrows, we keep the object same. Now, yes. an interesting question here is, what will happen if now I take this specific scenario and I specialize that to numbers? The question is, what number am I going to get there? So if I have six and three here, six and three. what number I'm going to get here? And, and the wonder is that we can answer this question again using, mm. multi, uh, using exponentiation. So whatever yes. number I'm going to get here, it will have the property that four to the power of that number, right? The number yes, of arrows yes. from question mark to four right. is going to equal the number of arrows from six to four times the number of arrows from three to four, right? Three to four, yes. So it's going to equal number of arrows from six to four, which is four to the power of six times. And here I want to ask the audience, what do they think this number is, which fulfills this equality? Uh, maybe they can, we can cheat because from our no, high no, school, we, yeah. What, oh, what no cheating. cheating. Okay. No cheating. Okay. So we have an answer. Uh, Do we have an answer? Not yet. Let's see. So what should I put we, in the place of question mark so that four to the power this, of that number is equal right. to four to the power six times four to the power three? Nine. Nine. Um, thank you, Sumaya, for that answer. Indeed, nine. And what is nine? How did we get it? The oh, power six X, plus right? three. Yeah, uh, it's six plus three. So you see what happens here. When I use this direct application, I get 
concept of multiplication of numbers. Right. But when I reverse arrows and then apply to numbers, I get the concept of addition of numbers. So now multiplication of numbers and addition of numbers arise from the same categorical idea, this, this idea, which read in one direction gives us multiplication yes. and read in the opposite direction when arrows are reversed gives us addition. So basically you are saying this addition and multiplication are of opposite processes. Yeah, which is something that nobody ever before could have imagined no, because nobody never. thought of this like before. Because we have been taught that multiplication, first we have addition and then we have multiplication. We never thought it's, it's just opposite way of the process. Right. Yeah. Uh, now we are approaching the, the limit of our time, but yes. I, I do want to say one thing that uh, the subject of elementary number theory right what does it do it studies how multiplication and addition interact with each other hmm. but now we see that multiplication and addition arise as different instances of the same idea in categories same. yes so we can bravely say that at least the language of category theory fully captures the entire subject of elementary number theory now, Definitely. this could be a misleading statement because that does not mean that every single result in elementary number theory we will be able to generalize for general categories. This category that we looked at in this lecture, this category of numbers and functions between them, this category is a very, very specific type of category. It has lots of properties that are not no longer true for general categories. Hmm. So we will not be able to generalize all results from number theory to general categories. That's not true. But mm -hmm. some of the, at least the most basic ones, we will be able to. And that's one of and, the yeah. illustrations of how category theory can give you an insight into a subject, in this case, arithmetic. And probably without category theory, it will not be possible to see this addition and multiplication as opposite operations. Yeah, that, that's, that's something we already mentioned, indeed, yeah. Yeah. Okay, probably we are almost at the end, and maybe we stop here today. Three o'clock. Yeah, I think we can stop. Um, so um, uh, what will happen after this is that uh, by the end of tonight, uh, there will be a blog post on lecture two, uh, yeah. which puts everything in writing. And uh, then... Um, uh, immediately after this, there is a session at Como Space, but that's something that Ilya will, will tell us more about. Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. No. Thank you, Zurab. Thank you. Thank you, Amartya, for the very interesting lecture. And uh, before we go to the what's happening afterwards, because I don't see any questions, and maybe you know if the people want to ask any clarification questions, they are welcome to raise their hand or they can type it in the Q&A. Okay, so there is a hand. Okay, so let's give Andrew and afterwards Yosef. Andrew, you're welcome to ask a question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say to um, uh, to uh, Amorto and Zurab, I at about half past two, I was starting to wonder where this was going. We'd seen lots of numbers and some apples, and it was all quite slow. But when I, when that that product, uh, uh, the product diagram went up with the eighteen dots, and then you went from here to the um, this general notion of a product, it really it really slotted into place. I mean, I've, I've seen this, this diagram defining the general notion of a product many, many times, but it, it really uh, has been very well justified. It, it, um, yeah, so thank you. Um, and, and then, yeah, the, again, seeing the, 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 the dual notion as well does, does suddenly make, make a lot more sense having had that, that long introduction. 
Um, so I was, yeah, at half past two, I was, I was skeptical, but now I'm, now I'm convinced. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, Very much. The, 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 thank you for your nice words, but despite of the nice words, we nevertheless apologize for boring you in the first half an hour. <laughs> um, but it's actually true. We we did go a bit too slow and then a bit fast afterwards. Um, but I will try to fix this uh, up a little bit in the in the blog. Um, maybe filling some details that we had to skip over when we had to had to go faster. But thank you so much for your for your insight. Joseph, you're welcome to ask your question. Ah, is there a name for the inverse of the general notion of a product? Yeah, yes, it's called co-product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sam, also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, can you understand me? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Joseph, yes. yes, we can hear him. Yes, of course. Yes, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I have now really understood uh, the product and the co-product much better. But I have read also that there's always a notion of a limit in connection with these. Can you shortly explain what the limit is in this connection? Uh, yes, Joseph, thank you so much for your question. So um, um, when we have a product, um, we can think of it like this. We can think of some initial data of objects we have. There are two of them. And what the product does, it provides some kind of cone over those two objects. So I'm just drawing this deliberately like this to then explain the idea of limit. So redrawing my previous picture, um, this is the notion of a product. And then the, the uh, defining property is that if I have some other C with the arrows, then there must exist unique H, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, what if these two objects that I started with, uh, I mean, at this point, these two objects that we're starting with are unrelated to each other. They're very independent of each other. And we saw the role of that independence in terms of, for instance, counting the number of arrows by multiplying and so on. But what if they were already related to each other in, in, in various different ways? Um, for example, they could be related by a third object. So I'm going to draw a different picture now where I'm going to add another ingredient to this where we have an object D and two arrows going to D. And uh, just as an example, this, these two arrows could be the inclusion. So I could think of A as um, something having two, two members in it and D having three members and B having maybe um, one member in it, or maybe three, and I'm just gonna add one more to D, okay. And so now I'm looking for this uh, substitute for A cross B, but this substitute should also be interact in, in some way with B as well. So there will be not just two arrows going to A and B, but there will also be an arrow going to D. And moreover, I want the, there to be an invariance rule that when I apply this arrow and then go th that way, it should be the same as going directly there, mm -hmm. going directly there. Uh, okay, so I add this extra um, require restriction on my diagram of projections. So this will be pi one, pi two, and pi three. And then the condition is the same. If I have some other object C with se similar setup, so now this time there are three arrows. Uh, let's say F, G, uh, and R. There must exist unique H such that all the composites arising from triangles as before. So before we had H composed with pi one needed to be equal to F and H composed with pi two needed to equal G. Now we will have H composed with pi one, it needed, needs to equal F. Uh, H composed with pi two needs to equal G. And also H composed with pi three needs to equal R, okay? So this is how I modify, kind of generalize the notion of product to, to get something that will be called the limit of, of this diagram. Um, and uh, just to 
I mean, after this, the, the, the next step of generalization is obvious. We, we can put any kind of diagram here we like and, and kind of interpret the conditions, adapt the conditions in a similar way as we adapted from, from the first picture to the second picture. And just to show you a concrete example of this, um, if the, the function from A to D was mapping that object here, and the one, the other object was being mapped here, and if B was being, being mapped the way I'm going to draw now, so the first object of B was being mapped to the second of D, and um, that way and that way, um, this new type of product, which is now called uh, a, a limit of, of, the, of the diagram below, is going to select those items in A and B that are, are mapped to the same place inside D. So there's only one. So uh, it's, it's this one. It's this one here on A side and, and on the B side, it's that one. So this, uh, in this specific case, the limit will actually consist of just one element that, that maps to there and there. But uh, I'm now doing a kind of big, um, uh, the dishonesty to the notion of limit because there are lots of interesting examples to consider and lots to say about these, but at least it gives you a summary of, of the idea of how, how one moves from product to a, a general limit. Uh -huh. uh, but the word limit is then um, not very, um, yeah, you cannot really, really uh, um, derive from the word limit what it means, yes? Mm -hmm. Really? Uh, we can interpret ordinary limit of a sequence in this way as well ah. oh. by drawing a suitable diagram. Yes. Um, uh, for, for instance, if I have um, numbers uh, going from, uh, let's say, uh, zero to some, so eventually I want uh, um, some approximation of the of the number pi. So, so, so let's say pi one is the first approximation of pi, and this is the interval zero uh, pi one, okay? And yeah. then I have second approximation of pi, which is a better approximation. So I have a, a, an inclusion of, of the first interval into the second one. And then I have a, a third approximation of pi, which is another inclusion. And, and I have an infinite diagram like this. Um, and I take the, uh, well, in this case, now we want the dual notion, the, the collimate. I take the collimate of that diagram. It will be exactly uh, the the uh, the interval zero pi. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ah yes, so, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you see this um, really if you at least look also at the cones of uh, three and and more and more objects, yes? The product of these, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it true? Sorry, I didn't, didn't understand that one. Um, and you see that this is a limit of a series. You can understand yeah. if you look also not only uh, not only at the product of two, but also of three, four, and, uh, and so on, uh, objects. Hmm? Um, are you referring to the third diagram? Yeah, yes, to the, to the right one, yes, mm -hmm. to the right one and further one, if you put also A, B, C, D, D and E and so on on, on it. Uh -huh. uh, because you write the series here, you write down the series of the approximations of pi. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joseph and Andrew, you can ask your second question. Thank you. Um, this is just a, a short a kind of historical question. Um, firstly, I, I assume that the notion of external direct product of groups and products of topological spaces, just for two examples, I, I assume that those were studied before this general categorical notion. Is, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. definitely. Okay. And, and then were there any sort of product-like notions that were being used that were that were found not to fit this this more general definition? Absolutely. Uh, for example, in graph theory, there are various ways you can define product of two graphs, and only one of them is a special case of categorical product. 
going back to vector spaces and abelian groups also, we have a notion of tensor product, which is very important in physics, right? So tensor product of vector spaces is neither product nor sum. It's a, it's a new type of operation. Yeah. And um, we, we do want to talk about tensor products of category theory as well. So what one does is one equips a category with an additional structure of combining objects into something that will be written even as a tensor product of the two objects. Uh, so a more axiomatic approach is taken there where we add to a category additional information instead of extracting the information from the existing category. And so there are indeed the uh, co constructions with objects which are neither limit and co-limit. And then if we want to consider those, then we'll have to um, develop a categorical machinery for dealing with, with, with them in the, in the context of a general category. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I do not see any more questions, but maybe, you know, if you have any other questions and you, you want to kind of to talk about in a little bit informal manner about the category theory and other other things. Yes, uh, Rena just posted the link into the into the chat to the Kumo space, where I assume we can now continue our discussion. Okay, let me thank the speakers again. Zurab, Amartya, thank you very much for the very interesting lecture. And of course, we're looking forward to continue our discussion or kind of our lectures next next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank, thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you. So we go to Kumo space. Uh, and uh, I think this link will disappear once the Zoom session will close. So if anyone wants to join us there, please. Yeah, first so copy it. That, yeah. <laughs> Just click on it. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you right. just now.